Hey everybody, uh, I'm not in class today. As you can probably tell, there's a substitute here. So I figured the best thing to do to cover the lecture format of our long block would be to have you guys go ahead and read along with me as I do my lecture. So let's get started. Political parties. A political party is a team of men and women seeking to control the governing apparatus by gaining office in a duly constituted election. Let's put this in normal talk. A political party is a group of people that are looking to control the government by gaining power through elections. That's it. Parties have three parts. There's a party in the electorate, there's a party in as an, as an organization, and parties in government. And we will talk about these three different types as we go through this section. Parties have jobs. The first and foremost job of a party is to pick candidates for elections. They run the campaigns for those candidates. They give cues to the voters. What's an important topic? What we should vote for? Okay. They articulate policies. What did the Democrat what does the Democratic Party stand for? What does the Republican Party stand for? They coordinate policy making. Okay? They help the parties figure out what policies they are for and what they are against. That's what parties do. That's what the apparatus of parties do. Let's talk about our friend Downs, right? The rational choice theory. We've been talking about this for a little while. People act in their own best interest, weighing the costs and benefits of possible alternatives. Downs loved parties, okay? Voters want policies they favor adopted by government, and two, they want parties to win elected office. Downs felt that voting for parties or being part of a party was the best way to get your vote to be counted and for it to mean something, okay? Remember, we talked about Downs in the past and saying that voting was a bad idea, right, unless you could make sure that it was meaningful, and parties is the best way to get your vote to be meaningful. Party image is the voters' perception of what the Republicans or Democrats stand for, such as conservatism or liberalism. These can have negative connotations, right? If the Republican Party has a bad image, the party has to work hard to make sure that they have a good image with the public. Right now, both parties do not have good images in the public. And we need, and the task of parties is to figure out how they make themselves look better and get elections, to win elections, to get votes. A party identification is a person's self-proclaimed preference for one party or the other. What do they want to be? What do they think they are? Okay, I am a Republican. I am a Democrat. That is party identification. Ticket splitting is when you go into a ballot and you vote for one party for one office and another party for other offices. This has become normal in American society. We see this as quite normal now in American voting. Okay. Someone will go in and vote for, say, Donald Trump at the top of the ticket for president, but vote for Richard Neal as their congressman because they feel like Richie's doing a great job. Okay, That's ticket splitting. Back in the day, many people used to go ahead and just see the R or the D and vote for those people. and It didn't matter because I'm a Democrat, I'm going to vote Democrat, or I'm a Republican, and I'm going to vote Republican. That's not how it is anymore. People split their votes. Party organization. Okay, let's talk about grassroots. Local parties. Some local parties are dominated by what's called a party machine or a political party organization that relies heavily on material inducements to win votes and to govern. This is how it used to be back in the day. I mean, it, there's a little of this now, but not. it's not as prevalent as it used to be, where the party would give jobs out to people to get people to vote for them, right? Vote early, vote off, and that phrase, people used to go out, they would go and, you know, I would get a job, a patronage job, and then those types of jobs would, would be would lead to me being a party regular and someone who voted to support the party and round up other people to vote for the party. A patronage job, I just mentioned, is a job, promotion, or contract given for political reasons rather than merit. This is used by party machines. We've seen a lot of these disappear 
over time. But we do start to see them coming back with the new administration, the Trump administration. A lot of the jobs that he gives out, especially to his family members, are patronage jobs. These are jobs that are given because, for political reasons, for support reasons, rather than any sort of idea of being qualified for those jobs. Right? Betsy DeVos is a fine example of this. This woman has very little public education experience, yet she was, she was be made the Secretary of Education because of her political support for the Trump campaign and for Republicans. That's patronage. What are the state party systems? A closed primary. Okay, This is how we determine who runs for office. A closed primary. Are people who have registered with the party can vote for party's candidates, okay? So you go in, you vote on primary day. In a closed primary, you can only vote for the party you're registered as, okay? That means if you're a Democrat, you vote in the Democratic Party you pr primary. You cannot vote in the Republican primary and vice versa. An open primary are, is in one in which voters decide on election day to vote in the Democrat or Republican primary. You walk in and you decide, I'm going to vote Democrat today, okay? Or I'm going to vote Republican because they have the better race and I'm concerned about that one. You don't have to pick, a, you don't have to register ahead of time. And you can go from one to the other. You can be a registered Republican but vote in the Democratic primary in an open primary. Then there are blanket primaries, which has a list of all candidates from all parties and you just vote and it doesn't matter. And the top, uh, the top finishers win the primary. Okay, that's a blanket primary. National party organization. So how is the national party organized? The Republican or the Democratic Party? Those are the two major parties. But most other minor third parties also have similar structure. A national convention is a meeting of party delegates every four years to choose a presidential ticket and to agree upon the party's platform. So every four years in the summer, most of these, uh, mostly it's usually in the summer, definitely for the large parties, they meet, they talk about who their, they decide on who their presidential ticket's going to be, who's running for president, and then they decide on the party's platform. What do we stand for? The National Committee is what keeps the party operating between conventions. Okay? So the Democratic National Committee or the Republican National Committee is what runs the party in between conventions. And then each of those parties has a national chairperson. They run the day-to-day -day activities of the party. Okay? The national chairperson person is way more influential in the party out of power than the party in power. For example, right now, the Democratic Party's chairman is a guy named Tom Perez. Okay, Tom Perez has a very influential role in the Democratic Party because they are not in power. The Republican Party's chairman is a person I can't even think of off the top of my head. But it doesn't really matter because the true Republican Party head is who? Donald Trump, the president. Top party in government, the party in government, excuse me, promises and policy. How does a par par party work in government? Elected officials who call themselves members of a party, they are what runs the government. That's how our government is structured, right? Republicans in Congress versus Democrats in Congress. A coalition are individuals and groups that support a political party to get them voted, voted in or elected, right? So in other words, Democrats have a coalition of people, of different types of demographic groups, right? They have hedge fund lawyers. They have blacks. They typically have Jewish people, right? Whereas Republicans have a coalition of white people, Christian conservatives, NRA groups, right? You see what I'm saying? These people match up together to help support a political party to get them elected to get what they want. Promises and policies. Parties try to translate their platform promises into public policy. That means they say this is what we support, this is our platform, and then when they gain power they try to make that platform 
into policy or law. Let's talk about party errors in human history. These are periods in which a majority of votes cling to party in power. Okay? Throughout United States history, we can see periods in which certain parties have certain powers or are in power for a certain period of time. A critical election is when there's an electoral earthquake, in quotes, where new issues and new coalitions emerge, where we see the upturning of a party era, where we see one party gain power over another after a certain period of time. We see party realignment. This is the displacement of a majority party by the minority party. This usually happens during a critical election. Let's talk about our party eras in U.S. history. The first party era, the first most important party era, from 1796 to 1824. This is the first party system. We see the formulation of parties. The Federalist Party was the first political party, and capitalists supported the Federalists. This was a big deal. The Democratic-Republican Party derived its coalition from agrarian interests, or farmers, and dominated the era after the 1800s. So between 1796 to 1800, it was a Federalist Party system. The Federalist Party was the reigning party, okay? Actually, sooner than that, right? But that's the point, okay? 1788, really. Washington didn't call himself a Federalist, but he really did align with Federalists. But from 1800 on, from Thomas Jefferson to 1824, the Democratic-Republican Party were the ruling party. Then we see the era of Jackson. Jackson and the Democrats versus the Whigs. Jackson is the first Democrat. Okay? This coalition included Westerners, Southerners, new immigrants, and settled America, people that lived in settled America. The Whigs coalition included people from the northern industry and southern planters, people that hated Jackson. The Whigs were a party that sprung up to be in complete opposition to Andrew Jackson. That was their purpose. Jackson was a Democrat. The Federalists disappeared as a party. They needed a counterbalance. The Whigs sprung up as a way to counterbalance the power of Andrew Jackson and the Democrats. The Democrats would still dominate this era from 1828 to 1856. From 1860 to 1928, we see a rise of the Republican Party brand new party on the scene, and how they were different in this time period. They structured themselves differently. It's interesting. From the Republican Party from 1860 to the end of the 1800s was about the opposition of slavery. But the main issue after slavery was abolished from about 1896 until 1928 was the economy, and they became very pro-business and pro-capitalist and they continue to be so today. The top Republicans dominated both party eras by forming new coalitions and winning both of these big, huge elections. 32 to 64, this is known as the New Deal era, or the New Deal coalition. It's a coalition forged by the Democrats who dominated politics from the 30s to the 60s. The basic elements are what make up people that still follow relatively the Democratic Party today. Catholics, Jews, poor people, Southerners, not so much anymore. The Southerners are the ones that left, but African Americans and intellectuals. The Southerners will leave in the 60s, and they leave in the 60s because of the Civil Rights Movement and the Democrats' support of civil rights. 1968 to the present, Southern realignment in the era of, of divided party government. So in 1987, we see Southern delegates rise in power. 77 of the 116 House seats and 6 of the 22 Senate seats were from Republican Southern um, party members. In 2009, 70 of 131 House seats and 15 of 22 House seats were from the GOP. So we see that structure, that power base that stays in play because of the Republican Party. The, Republican is going to, the Republicans are going to win the South for a long time, and they still control the South. And it is the ticket 
to Republican power. Republicans cannot win elections without winning the South. That has been proven time and time again. Divided government also typifies this period from 68 to now. Divided government is when one party controls the White House and the other party controls one or both houses of Congress. Okay? It's important to understand that they don't have to run both houses. They just need power in one house, and they can control, essentially, the agenda coming out of Congress. Both houses of Congress and the presidency have been controlled by the same party for just 14 of the last 44 years, from 1969 to 2012. But we see now that we have both houses of Congress being dominated by the Republicans. But that dysfunction, what isn't getting done, is part of a new lesson of how parties work. And that's a, uh, we'll talk more about that in class this week. Party dealignment is the gradual disengagement of people from parties, as seen in part by shr shrinking party identification. What's happening here is people are choosing not to align themselves with party and would much rather say they're independents. That's a big thing. We see a rise of independent declarations, people that say they're not part of any one party, but an independent. And this is people that are trying to s stay away from labels. They don't want to be labeled as one party or, an, or another. It's a very American tradition to do that. Third parties. How do they affect American politics? A third party can be defined as electoral contenders under, other than the two major parties. There are three basic varieties of third parties here in the United States. There are parties that promote certain causes. The Green Party is a fine example of this, right? Splinter parties. These are groups that break off from the major party in order to advance a particular agenda, right? Um, the Reform Party in the 90s was one of this. These are people that were part of the mainstream Republican Party, but then broke off because they had problems with the, main, the way the mainstream Republican Party was going. Also in the 60s, the Dixiecrats, okay? The Dixiecrat Party was a party that broke away from the Democratic Party. These were people that basically kept some, had belief in a lot of the Democratic ideals, but were against the Democratic's push to ending the civil, uh, to ending Jim Crow. These were people that wanted to keep Jim Crow in place. So they broke away from the Democratic Party and started their own party called the Dixiecrats. They would eventually find a safe home in the Republican Party. And then the third one is an extension of, pop, of a popular individual with presidential aspirations. Okay? This happens every now and again with a movement, with a person who is very popular as a third party individual. Um, and there's a, a, a movement to, to run them in a special party. Uh, Ralph Nader in 2000 needed a special place, a party, because he was a popular third party candidate. It doesn't seem like he was, but he was. Uh, things of that nature. Now, despite the lack of success of third parties in the United States, they are rather important. They do, and they, they give us a, a proper function in the U.S. They bring new groups of people into the electorate, okay? People that ordinarily would not get involved in politics get typically get wrapped up in the passion of a third party, right? If environmentalism is your issue, you get involved through the Green Party, okay? That's kind of the way it goes, and that pulls people in. They serve as safety valves for popular discontent. This, again, gives people an outlet. They see that there's a group that thinks like them. They don't have to riot. They don't have to use violence to try to get their agenda heard. They know that there's a party out there. They put a lot of social reforms on the political agenda. A lot of the economic, uh, excuse me, not economic, but environmental laws that we have today were put on by third party members. Okay. Uh, a lot of the other reforms that we see were typically brought to the fore by third parties, like uh, Medicare, like uh, what else? S not Social Security, but marijuana laws, for example, were brought to the fore by third parties first, and now they're seeing more uh, popularity through mainstream activity. Uh, gay marriage laws 
Uh, in Massachusetts, we have a party called the Green Party and a Rainbow Party. They are now combined, called the Green Rainbow. But that's where they came. The Rainbow Party was about gay, gay, lesbian, and transgender rights. They also bring new issues to campaigns ignored by major parties. Okay, the most famous example of this is the Peace Corps. Okay, um, President Kennedy often gets plenty of credit for bringing the Peace Corps into national politics and making it part of the national government policy. But it was actually the work of a third party candidate in that election. And he liked the idea and adopted it out on the Democratic platform. Two party governance. Why has the United States settled on two party governance? It may seem reductive, it may seem difficult, but this is why we like two parties, okay? It moderates our political conflict, okay? In order to get things done, the two big parties kind of have to moderate the crazy wings of their party. We don't see that often right now, but that's how it's supposed to work. It is also supposed to contribute to political ambiguity. In order to be, to fit the big party, you've got to be a little more ambiguous in your beliefs. You can't be so specific because then you'll be marginalized or ostracized inside the party. Democracy and responsible party government. How should people govern? The responsible party model says is a view about how parties should work. It said parties should offer clear choices to the voters who can then use those choices as cues to their own preferences of candidates. So in other words, parties shouldn't be ambiguous. They shouldn't be unclear. They should give clear choices to voters and voters can then use that information to vote for the candidates they want. And the, the responsible party model also says the party and government should carry out their campaign promises. Does this work all the time? We're starting to follow politics here in class. Many of you are following politics for the first time. You're going to see that this responsible party model doesn't always work the way it should. How should we govern continued? An example of this not working the way it should is the blue, our blue dog Democrats. These are fiscally conservative Democrats who are mostly from the South and rural parts of the United States, and they are resistant to any domestic policy proposals that would enlarge the scope of government. So they are sort of a mixture of a Republican and a Democrat. They tend to be very economically conservative and a little bit socially liberal. And this is a conundrum for the Democratic Party. And it's and it flies in the face of a lot of the voters in the Democratic Party. So that's the kind of thing where responsible party government doesn't work the way it should. American political parties in the scope of government. A lack of uniformity keeps government small, but also makes cutting government programs difficult. Right? The idea that once something gets in place, it's hard to cut. Individual politicians focus on getting more from government for their own constituents. This is a problem with uh, political parties and with politicians, right? It's about bringing home the bacon to your district, okay? This is how people get elected. They don't so care, so much care about the national government. Well, they do, but when given the choice to keep their job or do something for the country at large, they're going to do what they can to keep their job. That's that, everybody. We did it. How do you feel? I had fun with this. I'll be back on Wednesday for questions. Please make sure you read Fed List number 10. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much, everybody. You're the best.